Shadows in the hallway. The hallway lights flickered above us, casting shadows that danced across Alice's smug expression. Her eyes gleamed with a mix of amusement and challenge. The air grew thick with the weight of my humiliation. I need a minute, Alice, I murmured, turning away from her to face the chalkboard. The room was a candy-coated pink, my personal haven from the school's institutional beige. It was where I had hoped she'd confess her love, not tell me that our trysts were just casual. Her voice grew softer but no less smug. Valerie, don't make a scene. I felt her hand on my shoulder, trying to turn me back to face her. The fabric of her dress whispered against my skin, a stark reminder of the secrets we'd shared. I stepped out of her grasp, my eyes burning. How can you be okay with this? I whispered, staring at the floor. The cold linoleum was a stark contrast to the heat of the gym's dance floor. You're married. Steve and I have an understanding, she said, as if that explained everything. And it's not like we're in love. He has his interests. Ihemine. The implication stung. Her interests. I had been her interest. A distraction. A way to pass the time until something better came along or she got bored. The reality washed over me like a bucket of ice water. I turned back to face her, my voice shaking. What happens now? Alice shrugged, her expression unchanged. We keep it going, I guess. Unless you want to stop. The question hung in the air, a silent dare. Did I want to stop? Part of me did, but another part craved the thrill, the danger. I can't do this, I finally said, my voice barely above a whisper. Alice's smile faltered for a moment before she nodded. Okay, if that's what you want. But remember, I didn't do anything wrong. You're the one who couldn't keep your feelings in check. Her words stung, but I couldn't argue. She was right. I had let myself believe in a fantasy, one where she'd leave her husband for me. It was time to face reality. As we left the classroom, the music grew louder, the bass thumping through the walls. The students were lost in their own worlds, oblivious to the drama playing out in the shadows of the hallway. I took a deep breath, trying to compose myself before re-entering the fray. Mr. Fulton was still at the punch bowl when we arrived, a sad, pathetic figure in his ill-fitting chaperone shirt. He looked up, a question in his eyes, but Alice just winked and handed him a fresh cup of Kool-Aid. Everything okay? He called out. I nodded, forcing a smile. Just a little girl talk. He nodded back, his gaze lingering on me for a moment too long before returning to his post. My stomach turned. How could he be so calm? Did he really not care? Or was he just good at hiding his feelings? The rest of the night passed in a blur of fake smiles and awkward glances. I couldn't bring myself to look at Alice, let alone speak to her. The Kool-Aid had turned sour in my mouth, and the dance floor had lost its allure. As the lights came up and the music faded, I realized that my life had irrevocably changed. I had been living a lie, and now it was time to face the music. But what was the price of that lie? Would I be able to look Mr. Fulton in the eye again, knowing what I'd done to him? And what about Alice? Could I ever forgive her for making me feel like such a fool? The three of us stood there, a silent tableau of betrayal and deceit, until the janitor announced it was time to leave. I grabbed my purse and coat, avoiding their eyes. See you tomorrow, Mr. Fulton said, his voice devoid of emotion. I nodded, my heart racing. Good night, Steve. It was the first time I had ever called him by his first name, and it felt like a betrayal to the woman he had married. But in that moment, I was the injured party. Alice was already striding away, her heels clicking against the floor as if she didn't have a care in the world. I watched her go, feeling a strange mix of anger and pity. What kind of person could be so cold about something so intimate?
As I walked to my car, the cool night air did nothing to soothe my burning cheeks. The parking lot was mostly empty, and the distant sound of laughter and engine starts seemed to mock me. When I finally pulled out of the school and onto the quiet streets, I felt a weight lift from my chest. The neon lights of the town flashed by, a blur of color and sound that matched the chaos in my head. The next day at school was a dance of awkward avoidance. Alice would smile and wave from across the hallway, but I would dip into a nearby classroom or pretend to be engrossed in a conversation with a student. Mr. Fulton continued to greet me with the same forced politeness as always, and I wondered if he could see the turmoil behind my eyes. The days turned into weeks, and the whispers grew louder. It wasn't just my conscience anymore. Rumors had started to spread. Teachers talked in hushed tones in the lounge, and students smirked when they saw us together. I knew it was only a matter of time before it all came to a head. One afternoon, as I was grading papers in my classroom, the door creaked open. I didn't look up, assuming it was a student looking for extra credit. But when no one spoke, I glanced up to see Mr. Fulton standing in the doorway, his arms crossed. Can I help you? I asked, trying to keep my voice steady. He stepped inside, closing the door behind him. We need to talk, Valerie. The room felt suffocatingly small. What about? He sighed, his shoulders slumping. You know what about? I swallowed hard, my palms damp against the paper. I don't know what you're referring to. His eyes bore into me, and I felt naked under his gaze. Don't lie to me. The words hung in the air a challenge. I took a deep breath, stealing myself. Okay, fine. What do you want to say? He leaned against the desk, his eyes never leaving mine. I want to know why. I blinked, taken aback by his question. Why what? Why you did it? Why you slept with my wife? The room spun and for a moment I thought I might be sick. It just happened. That's not good enough, he said, his voice low and even. You're a smart woman. You knew what you were doing. I didn't mean to, but you did. His eyes were cold now, and now you have to live with it. With those words, he turned and left, the door slamming shut behind him. I sat there, my heart pounding, as the reality of what was happening crashed down on me. The next few days were a blur of tension and fear. I avoided Alice and Mr. Fulton as much as possible, but the whispers grew louder. I knew I couldn't keep running from the truth forever. I had to face the consequences of my actions. Finally, I decided to go to the principal. I couldn't let this ruin my career, my life. I had to come clean. As I sat in her office, the words spilled out of me, a confession I never wanted to make. She listened, her face a mask of professionalism, until I had finished. Thank you for telling me, Valerie, she said, her voice cold. I'll handle it from here. And just like that, it was out of my hands. The gossip had become fact, and the school had to deal with the scandal. Alice was transferred to another school, and Mr. Fulton was left to pick up the pieces. I never saw Alice again, not after that night. But every time I saw Mr. Fulton in the hallway, his eyes held a sadness that pierced through the facade of his usual stoic demeanor. I felt guilty, but also a strange sense of relief that she was no longer a part of my life. The scandal had left its mark, and whispers followed us both wherever we went. But as the months passed, the whispers grew quieter, and the awkwardness between us grew less pronounced. One evening, I found myself working late, grading papers in my now empty classroom. The school had become a prison of sorts, the walls holding in the memories of what had happened. But as I looked out the window, watching the last of the students leave, I felt a strange sense of peace. The sun was setting, casting a warm glow across the quad, and for the first time in a long time, I didn't feel suffocated by the secrets that had once filled the air. 
As I was about to leave, I heard a soft knock on the door. I froze, expecting to see the principal or one of the other teachers. But when I opened it, it was Mr. Fulton standing there, his tie askew, his eyes tired. Can I come in? He asked, his voice barely above a whisper. I nodded, my heart racing. What could he possibly want from me now? He stepped inside and closed the door behind him. I wanted to talk, he said simply, taking a seat in one of the desks. I sat down behind my own, the barrier between us feeling suddenly necessary. About what? He took a deep breath, his eyes searching mine. I know you didn't mean for any of this to happen, and I know it's not your fault that Alice is the way she is. I nodded, unable to speak. But I need you to understand something, he continued. I'm not okay with it. I'm not fine. I'm broken. The pain in his voice was palpable, and I felt my own eyes fill with tears. I'm sorry, I whispered, the words feeling inadequate. He leaned forward, his elbows on his knees. But I can't hate you for it. I don't blame you. It's just, it's complicated. For a moment, we sat there in silence, the weight of his words hanging heavily in the air. Then he stood up, straightening his tie. I just wanted to tell you that. I don't expect anything from you, but I needed you to know. With that, he turned and left the room, leaving me sitting in the dimming light, the echo of his footsteps the only sound in the empty hallway. As the days turned into weeks, and the whispers finally died down, I found myself looking at Mr. Fulton with new eyes. He wasn't just the sad, cuckolded husband anymore. He was a man trying to piece his life back together, trying to find his way in a world that had shifted beneath his feet. And somehow through all of it, he had managed to maintain his dignity. We didn't become friends, not really. But there was a newfound respect between us, a shared understanding that we had both been victims of Alice's selfishness. We nodded in the hallways, sometimes even exchanged a few polite words. And in those moments, I realized that maybe there was a way to move on from the chaos she had left in her wake. Life at the school eventually returned to normal, or at least as normal as it could be after a scandal like that. I threw myself into my work, focusing on my students and my career. And as the months turned into years, Mr. Fulton and I grew apart, our shared history nothing more than a distant memory. But every now and then, when the hallways were quiet and the echoes of the day had faded away, I would think of that night in the classroom, of the raw pain in his voice when he told me he was broken. And I would wonder if he had ever truly found a way to heal.